it over to Natalie. What is the first part of your last Zayas. name? Sorry? Zayas. Zayas Delgado. And uh, the second speaker just walked in the room. Right, right. And Bruce Delgado is here. We'll maybe have a few words from the mayor. So welcome to our program. We have, uh, for those people who may not have been here before, there are restrooms out to your left. And we will be showing the film first. And after the film, then we'll have a short break, as I said, for refreshments, or you can get anything now you'd like to. And then we'll have our two speakers, uh, Lucille Calderon and Carol Erickson, and we'll have a discussion after the film. Um, I am not the co-chair of WILF anymore. I am just on the program committee. And I'm also on the board of the Monterey Peace and Justice Center. And because the Peace and Justice Center is a co-sponsor, we have wonderful help from a service lender from CSUMB, Robert Moore, who has been helping the Peace Center this semester in various capacities. We have a new show that's up at the uh, Peace Center called What We See, photographs taken by women without shelter. It had been at the Monterey Museum of Art last year, and Robert created all of these wonderful places to hang the statements from the women, in addition to the photographs taken by homeless women. There were testimonials. So Robert's greatly appreciated. I believe that um, I don't have to do a disclaimer because this library doesn't require it. The Monterey Library does ask that we do a disclaimer that the views here are not necessarily those of the uh, staff. But I'm sure that I could just say that the views expressed in the film and afterwards are not necessarily those of the Monterey County Free Library System, even though I'm sure individually they're very supportive and the library has been great. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Natalie, if you'd like to say a few things, and then I'll introduce the uh, film after that. Okay. So thank you all for coming. I am Natalie Zayas Delgado. I'm the chair of Citizens for Sustainable Marina. And Bruce Delgado is on our board, and so is Blanca at the back table. Um, and please help yourself. I promise you the vegetables and the strawberries are all organic. Um, so help yourself to the food. We have more if it gets low. And if you sign in and leave your email address, I'll put you on our list and you'll get more information about other events we do. So thank you all for coming and thank you, Judy and um, the Peace Centers. We all kind of came together to put this on. Thank you. Okay, so I'll introduce the film, and this was a film that was brought to my attention by uh, Katharina Harlow uh, quite a while ago, and she had just come back from Vietnam, and I guess when she was there, she heard about this film, and it is a film that uh, is, I would say it has great importance for people around the world, but especially for us in this country, because our country not only has Monsanto as one of the big uh, producers of pesticides, but there are a number of other pesticide companies that are continuing to export pesticides to other places. Either they haven't been registered, licensed, or they haven't banned here, but they're still shown abroad. And you'll see that in the picture. I, this morning, I was reading a book that my mother co-authored at MPC when she was a teacher there. It was an anthology. And they had a, an essay saying, this land is our land. And in it, it was written in the 60s, but it talked about agriculture. and the corporations that in this state, Standard Oil and Teneco and other big corporations that own a lot of the land, that not only have uh, farms, but they produce pesticides and they sell oil. And so they've just sort of cornered the market on this corporate model for agriculture. We know though that in the other direction, there are a lot of organic farms in our area. We're blessed. Alba, we have the farmer's market, so we know they're organic farms that are proliferating. Even Driscoll, which is one of the big um, companies in our area. I, I work with uh, a woman whose husband is the CEO of Driscoll. I do the gathering for women. And so Driscoll is very, very um, big. They have uh, subcontractors that grow the food, but even they are going to organics in, in many respects. So we'll see the film. We'll be a short break. And then um, we will have a discussion with the two speakers, Lucia Calderon, who's with Safe Ag, Safe School. She's the uh, program director for New York. Community, Community organizer. I don't know why. I, 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 she tells me that, but it's more than that. She's not just a community organizer. She's the information person, and she just has been so influential. She's 
going to be going back to graduate school, so I guess when are you leaving for graduate school? In June. But she's been indispensable. Carol Erickson is a volunteer. She was with uh, Safe Strawberries even before uh, she was involved with Safe, uh, SASS SAS. So get started. And Robert, you'll do the honors. And we'll sit. So if you came in late, I'll briefly introduce the speakers. Or actually, they can introduce themselves. I think they're fine. They know themselves far better than I do. So um, I'll turn it over to uh, Lucia and Carol. Great. Well, my name is Lucia Calderon. Thanks for having me here. I am currently the community organizer and media coordinator for a statewide coalition called Californians for Pesticide Reform. And my everyday work is with the community coalition, the amazing coalition called Safe Ag Safe Schools, which um, is a group of community members, nurses, farm workers, teachers, parents, uh, union leaders from all over Santa Cruz and Monterey counties fighting to protect uh, their community, our community, from the health harms of pesticide exposure. Um, I've had the pleasure to work with some people in this room, um, especially with Carol. Carol Erickson. Uh, I've been with the, the forerunner to Safe Ag, Safe Schools, which was called Safe Strawberries. It was quite effective in um, talking about the problems with methyl bromide. That will be familiar to any of you who followed Cesar Chavez's career. He wasn't protesting just growing raisins and grapes. He's protesting the pesticide that was being used on those raisins and grapes. And he, like most of the farm workers, probably suffered some ill effects from his exposure. Um, there was a very nasty pesticide that was proposed for use in the United States, and it was completely approved by our national EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, because we need something good and powerful. This would be added to the some 200 new and powerful pesticides already in use, often in consecutive use. That pesticide is known to be one of the most toxic things on earth. It's studied in laboratories where there's a big fuel hood. Scientists are all geared and garbed up in hazmat suits with respirators. A fuel hood pulls off any chemical residues that are going into the air up the chimney. What happens after that? I don't know. But at least the scientists are being exposed. You don't want to kill your scientists. They use a tiny amount per experiment. This was going to be incorporated into a new spray to go on our fields. California's own Department of Pesticide Regulation, which is a nice title, unfortunately not a very effective body, said, fine, California approves it too. It's going to be used on strawberries. That really galvanized people who know how to look at science. You don't have to be a scientist to understand it because there's always a simplified version. And even though I'm trained in a lot of science, I read the simplified version first so that I get the big picture. We began to protest. We had public hearings. We had them all over the place. Frank, you were part of that. We had a giant hearing in Salinas, at which some speakers from UC Berkeley, who has a special program on toxicology, had their speakers. Uh, from an organic farmer who's raised strawberries in Santa Cruz County for the last 30 years. He used to do it the other way, non-organic. He said, everybody got sick. My workers were sick. I can't do that. So we shifted to organic. We filled the Hartnell College auditorium with people. Farm workers, a lot of students of agriculture, a lot of big ag people, the owners and growers, the shippers, a lot of pesticide representatives. All the panels spoke. Then we brought all that information to our county board of supervisors. 
And we said, we can't have this in this county. We can't control the state of California, but we, you have a lot to say about this county. When the, when the manufacturer of that chemical found that out, this county was really hitting it hard. We went to Sacramento to talk about it, to the people who were in charge. There was a decision, no, California will not use this pesticide. The manufacturer pulled out of the entire US, but he did exactly what the film just said. He sent all his poison, which he continues to manufacture, to other countries that don't have citizens who say, you can't do this here. This is why we have public hearings. We've had public hearings on a lot of things. This is a public hearing, in a way, about the nature of the problem. I'm a retired nurse. I was a midwife. And now I do a lot of education on this issue. So we're with the Dalai Lama, right? Yeah. <laughs> Educate. This is what's going on. Um, I love this film. This was my second time seeing it. And it, a lot of the points hit a lot harder the second and what it really makes me think about, you know, thinking about the work that I do and all the community members that work alongside me, it makes me think of the phrase, think globally, act locally. Um, you know, as the film shows, there are chemicals that are banned in the EU and the United States that are still used um, throughout the world in less regulated countries. Um, here in the United States, the federal EPA just reversed the ban on this very neurotoxic insecticide called chlorpyrifos. Um, that has decades of science behind its harms on um, the developing brain and lungs. And in California, another you know similar story is that our Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment um, recently listed glyphosate, the main ingredient in Roundup, as a top 65 carcinogen. And then farmers from all over the all over the United States sued them. Um, for this decision and these lawsuits are most likely going to result in California not being able to label um, Roundup as a carcinogen. They, they sued them against the, the labeling of this product. Um, and then here in Monterey County, just over um, the beautiful hills, um, over 9 million pounds of pesticides were applied in 2016. Those reports just came out earlier this week. Um, and here, more than anywhere else, or equally as everywhere else, this globalized culture of deregulated pesticide use shines through very strong. Um, so examples that come to mind are, um, in the Salinas Valley, the perpetrators of pesticide poisonings very rarely um, are, shown, are, are brought to justice. Um, some of the most harmful chemicals can be used within hundreds of feet of schools and neighborhoods. Um, Farm workers are, are still today intimidated out of reporting pesticide malpractice. And requests for community to be notified of nearby pesticide applications are at worst flat out denied and at best put off indefinitely. Um, and all the while, you know, since the fight uh, for methyl bromide and methyl iodide, or against methyl bromide and methyl iodide, all the while pesticide drift continues to pose a really pervasive health threat. Um, putting communities at higher risk of cancer, respiratory problems, uh, reproductive and developmental disorders. So our coalition, Safe Bag Safe Schools, formerly Safe Strawberries, um, and formerly I think even other names before that. Um, <laughs> just the just people concerned about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're focused on preventing these tragic health harms um, by protecting children first. So. Um, just like a lot of characters in this film, uh, we have parents whose children have frequent asthma attacks at school. There was a, a, a child sent to the hospital in Greenfield a few months ago right after five different chemicals um, known to be uh, respiratory irritants and one known to cause asthma were applied um, just upwind uh, earlier that day, um, a little over a half a mile away. Uh, we have teachers involved whose students were held back a year from school because they had so many, they had such frequent asthma attacks that they missed so much class that they couldn't move on to the next grade. Um, or students who are blind because the surgery they had to remove their brain tumors left them without eyesight. 
um, students who, I'm thinking of teachers in Salinas who have students that they've said they, they're in second grade but they can't comprehend um, some of the most basic things and they haven't found ways to be able to really make the, these connections with these students and they see a connection with the huge amount of uh, neurotoxic pesticides that are applied around them. Um, or, or I'm thinking of a teacher in Salinas who's uh, she works so hard every day to make sure that her high school students make it to college and she's so disappointed when she hears of numerous students who have to come back from school because they started facing health problems that um, made it impossible for them to continue going to class. Um, or nurses who will see people with long-term health impacts related to pesticide exposure or see farm workers coming in after um, uh, instances of acute pesticide poisoning. And then there are the longtime activists who are battling chemotherapy right now or dealing with long-term health impacts that they connect to their days as children running through the fields or chasing the helicopter spray. Um, so we have pushed uh, local and state authorities to regulate pesticide use near schools. Our demand has been for a one-mile buffer zone, uh, pesticide-free buffer zone around schools and a one-week advance notification to these schools when pesticide applications will take place um, and amidst all the work that still must be done um, we have had uh, a few small victories that really keep our momentum going and keep our power growing so um, January 1st of this year the State Department of Pesticide Regulation um, implemented quarter mile buffer zones around schools um, that that means that the most drift prone pesticide applications cannot take place from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday during the school year. Um, and it also requires growers within a quarter mile of schools to release a list of all the chemicals that they intend to apply for the following school year um, by April 30th of every year. So that's tomorrow, actually, the first time it's going to happen. Um, and this is, I mean, this is a previously unheard of rule. California is deemed the first state to take action on pesticide use around school, and that's all thanks to the work that was done here um, in Monterey County and Santa Cruz counties in collaboration with our allies all across the state. Um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be happening today if it wasn't for people like Carol um, fighting, you know, ever since the days of methyl iodide and before that, fighting for the field postings in the 80s. Um, yeah. And it's totally groundbreaking policy, but we do know that much more needs to be done to truly protect the kids in Monterey County. Um, one in four Monterey County school children, according to a 2014 Department of Public Health study, attend school within a quarter mile of the heaviest pesticide use in the state. So that's 25% of kids here. And uh, Latino kids in Monterey County are more than three times as likely to attend these schools than their white counterparts here. Um, so our call for a one-mile buffer zone um, and one-week advance notification still stands very strong. Um, we're not stopping there. Uh, we have significant work to do on making sure that teachers, staff, and students, and parents, and community members are afforded their right to know. We believe it is a right to know. Um, when and what pesticides are going to be applied around where you go to school and where you live and where you work. Um, so our next challenge is to make sure that the state mandated school notifications that I just spoke of, that annual list, um, become a little more transparent. Um, and we're also pressuring our local agricultural commissioner, um, both here in Monterey County and Santa Cruz County as well, to tell schools exactly when potentially hazardous pesticide applications are going to take place. Uh, Lucia, could you say a little bit about the new Ag Commissioner because it, they, they've gone through a change. It was uh, Eric Lortzen, yeah, so and he's no longer there. So could you just talk a little bit about who the new Ag Commissioner is? Eric Lortzen um, was our former Ag Commissioner. He's now working with the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Um, so in his spot, they hired um, uh, the former Ventura County Ag Commissioner. His name is Henry Gonzalez. Um, we. We're very, very hopeful about this. We heard great things. He's from Monterey County, um, you know, a Latino guy from a farm working community. Um, but unfortunately, our, our interactions with him have not been super positive so far. Um, we had a great victory in Greenfield 
where we're just starting to do a lot of advocacy. We had a great victory at a school board meeting where um, the school board passed a resolution that committed them to working more with the agricultural commissioner and with the state to improve buffer zones around their schools and um, notification practices and um, actually the same man in the room right now, Wes, took a great video of that and apparently it circulated to the Ag Commissioner um, and he told Fair us well. that we were very misinformed Whoa. Oh, wow. and that we need to learn more um, and if we knew if we knew what was really going on we wouldn't be concerned. Yeah. And so, did he offer um, any real evidence or did he just... No, no oh. and, um, and so our response to that was well please meet with us. Um, we want to know where we're misinformed because our coalition formed to get the right information and to share that with the community and we want to make sure that we are doing that. Um, but the big, um, the big problem with that meeting was when we asked him to work harder to notify communities, he said, oh, you know, if I notify people, then they're going to get worried. If I tell them when pesticides are going to be sprayed around them, then they're going to freak out. And we said, well, you just kind of contradicted yourself right there. Because he said, if we got, if we had the information, we wouldn't be worried. But now when we ask for the information, you're saying that it's, it, we wouldn't be able to handle it. <laughs> so um, we, have, we have formally asked him to meet with our coalition. That meeting that I'm speaking of was only with me and one other person. And we want him to be able to tell the whole coalition, you know, what's really going on. Um, and that request has been, um, has not been answered yet. Belayed. Um, but we're also um, in a battle with the Ag Commissioners and the state to restrict a brain and lung, the brain and lung harming insecticide I mentioned earlier called chlorpyrifos, get it out of our state, get it out of our counties, um, and maybe Carol can talk a little bit more about that because I've been collabing for a while. Um, but but one, one thing that, that I must really say, just kind of reflecting back on the film, um, you know, in the work that we're doing and when you hopefully help us in the future, um, in our advocacy, we really do have to continue to remember this, this circle of poisons, uh, you know, issue. Um, our victories at the local level really do have global implications. Um, and our work here, just like uh, the buffer zone rule it, throughout California, our work here can really serve as an example for the rest of the state, the rest of the country, the rest of the world. Um, but the pesticides companies, they're not off the hook once we get their product out of our town. Um, and we really need to be following up, and this is going to be a very, very, very long fight. Um, and it won't be one until food is grown in a safe and sustainable and just way. Um, all over the world, but I truly believe we have to start somewhere, so that's why we do the work that we do. Um, so, yeah, thanks everyone for the support, and I'll, I'll let Carol take over from here. In this film, you couldn't help but be impressed by the concern for the children who are born with deficits or who develop deficits, whether it's a learning deficit, a movement de deficit, big tumors developing, hydrocephalus, which is uh, water on the brain is the quick and easy definition of that. And you see how disabled they are in poor places that don't have all the facilities. A visiting doctor probably comes once every six or eight weeks to see them. And there's not much you can do except take care of the child. We have those same children here in Monterey County. We have them mostly up and down the Salinas Valley, which runs into Santa Cruz County. We have them in San Benito County. They are not in the same circumstances. We have medical care once a child is ill. The care isn't going to heal them all. Once this damage is done, especially the organophosphates, like chloropicrin, like chlorpyrifos, like methyl iodide, like methyl bromide. Remember, methyl iodide is technically no longer used in this country, only manufactured here, for the benefit of the manufacturer, of course. With all those things still going on, we can't cure any of it, the damage that's done. We can give supportive care. We can try to make the environment safer for kids. We've been asking for a mild buffer zone around schools. Schools are, are a, you know, a hot button issue because those are kids. The teachers are 
passionate about stop making the kids sick. And they're very outspoken, very articulate. A doctor from uh, Stanford was visiting Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital and spoke with one of the emergency room nurses there who happens to be a very active member of our coalition and a budding organic farmer herself. He said, you know, I thought Salinas would be much bigger than this because half the kids in our pediatric oncology unit, the kids' cancer unit at Stanford, are from this valley. Now, that's a lot of people. When you try to connect the dots, people don't want to know that it's what's being sprayed on the crops or eaten with the crops or carried in on farm workers' clothes and a child runs up and hugs mommy or daddy. People don't want to know that. Because what are you going to do about it? You've got to stop it. Our efforts have been long and hard. They make some progress, but by talking to more people who go home and say, this is what I learned about it. These public hearings, you need to pay attention. A lot of good stuff online. The Safe Ag Safe School has a great Facebook page, as well as a web website. It links with a lot of this stuff, so you can bring that information if you like. It's, there's opposition. People say, we've always used pesticides. You won't get those strawberries anymore. You won't ever have strawberries again if we don't use pesticides. <laughs> they, have, they have told us that. Point blank. You like to eat salads? Forget salads. Well, how about all the organic farming, which is growing at a faster rate in this county than the conventional, so-called conventional, because it becomes so typical to use pesticides? This doesn't, I mean, that's, this can't both be true. So we continue the fight. There are some very good publications, the kind of things that you can kind of carry with you. This is called What to Do in Case of Pesticide Exposure. It's now required by law that any field worker who suspects he or she has been exposed to pesticide tell the boss or can call 911 and they are to be given medical care examination at the cost to the grower. If that was your living, because that, that's the way you fed your family was to work in the fields, how quickly are you going to report? The law says you can, and you cannot be fired, it says. But you need to know if you've been exposed, if your symptoms fit with that. So in English and Spanish, and there are people from the uh, legal community who work in the fields, the California Rural Legal Assistance. We have a very active lawyer who's in our group. We can get translators for some of the uh, languages that are not Spanish or English, the, the dialects from southern Mexico. To tell people this is what this is what exposure is. Your eyes sting, you can't breathe, you get really, really dizzy, you can hardly stand up, you feel like you're gonna vomit, you might vomit, you fall down. You can tell people about that. But if it's your job to do that, how quickly are you gonna do it? And not earn your day's wage. Are there any questions that people might have. I just also want to just tag on one quick thing. When you're talking about, when you talk to people about this, um, I was at the Monterey City Council meeting and planning department meeting when they had the issue of cell towers come up and the room was packed to overflow. People so concerned about their health from impact from cell towers, but they had the public comment period. So I did go up there and I said, I'm glad that you're really aware and concerned about the people and your health and I said, you know, I hope this concern extends to the people who are working in our fields and exposed to the pesticides because you feel that, that we are educated people and, and therefore 
we should care about all these in environmental things that are impacting us. But definitely, you know, we've got to make sure that people are aware of what you're talking about. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Anybody would like to share a question or a comment? Um, I know, Christy, you do the work, too, with SafeAg. Did you want to add anything from your experience? Well, uh, I, I was kind of doing this solo before I met Lucia and Carol and started going to meetings. And there's a lot of support um, from the, the, the SAS meetings and people. Um, there's a greater community of activists and people that are aware. The UFW, uh, I've been fortunate to be able to talk to several people from that organization and hear their stories. And um, my own experience uh, has to do with the fact that my son was uh, diagnosed uh, October 14th, uh, uh, 1994 with ALL leukemia. And uh, when that happened, um, I probably would not be interested or involved except that over the next six to nine years as we were going back and forth to Stanford, um, my, my son did survive his cancer and he went on to get a degree in forestry at Humboldt and is now taking care of trees all over the greater San Francisco area. So um, yet, uh, my experience at the time um, with the nurses, the doctors, the janitors, the lab people, a whole flotilla, I mean a whole bunch of people uh, would casually uh, walking down the very, 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 very long hall in Stanford proper, not the Lucille Packard, to go for a CAT scan. Uh, I'll never forget as we, you know, slowly walked down this mile long hall and uh, the person walking with us, uh, you know, was complimenting my son on his new Ugg boots. And he was a uh, uh, t 11, 12 at the time, and he had been diagnosed at 10. So um, he thought he was the cat's pajamas with those Ugg boots, you know. And so we're we're going down. And I'm grateful for the the art on the walls because that did give me a distraction from the devastation that I I have felt since. You know, will never go away. Um, but. Um, uh, she casually said, you know, well, we sure get a lot of people from your area. And that was one of many, many, many experiences. And, and actually, to tell you, uh, the, the, the initial impetus was as we were told my son was diagnosed, he went in uh, and did a week of tests. And then we had the sit down with the doctors where they were telling us what the test showed. And you know, basically it was pretty technical. It's on this chromosome and da da. And if this happens, there's this percent of a chance. And if that happens, there's that percent. And you know, if the bone marrow happens, there's that. And what was the nationality? Oh, he's Puerto Rican, Japanese. Ooh, that's not so good. And, so we were bouncing off. I call it the rubber room conversation. And I, I had this thought when I was talking to Michael Marsh at the CRLA, the rubber room, as we were bouncing off the walls, um, the doctor said, actually, it's 100% for Justin either way. And we're going to do our very best to make him better. you know. And then that was quickly followed by, how did he get this? And you either get it with in, heredity or environment. And so they asked us to go back into our hereditary, and we, were, you know, we gave them a little bit. There was some uh, answer there. But environment, we gave them other answers, you know, and they were all really good. My son's father was a forester for the city of Monterey in Pacific Grove. He sprayed the trees. It might have been on his clothes. We had the house sprayed by the schools are sprayed, but this was you can go to, you know, Terminex with the big bug on on the roof and that, and 
uh, the Leukemia Society research has now shown that, that even having your own private home sprayed can lead to leukemia. We gave them all these really good reasons and they kept saying no and you feel so guilty because it's your child and you, you, you just are, are, you don't have an answer and they kept saying no. We'd give them a good reason, no, which are all real good reasons. They'd say no and finally they say no, no. It'd have to be massive amounts over a very long period of time. And I had just found out my son had leukemia. So I found out at that point that my son was in a club. You know, he wasn't the only 10-year-old little boy, that he was part of a, a greater community. And something really had to be done about it. You know, I mean, it, 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 at that point, I became an ad advocate and an, an activist and um, since then and with having so many people doctors nurses casually saying we sure get a lot of people from your area you know woke me up you know I just went and then I was on a campaign did some research at MPC and got some facts and I was talking to everybody I could possibly talk to and telling them 250,000 tons a year and that was, now it's 450,000 tons a year on California soil. You know, and I was all in this myself and then I found SAS. We went to Sacramento four times this summer. We talked to... Yeah, uh, right, busloads. We talked to the DPR, we talked to the EPA and we changed things, we did. Our voices, even though that Scott Pruitt still has his job, you know, we we let him know we don't like him. <laughs> you know? And we we keep. I was at the Cesar Chavez march, and a lot of support there. So I'm just so grateful for SAS. Well, we offer those same services to anybody who wants to call and ask questions, who wants to come to our meetings, who wants us to come and talk show a shorter film than this because this one takes up quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. But but we we've got lots of on the on the road kind of shows that we can do. And people get to talk about their own personal experience. And the buses that went up to Sacramento when they did lobby, it was wonderful to see the young people that went up there too as part of the group that went with you people. I thought that was just uh, at one of the SAS meetings there was um, you know pictures of, of I don't I can't remember if it was a PowerPoint or a little video but it, it was it was just remarkable and, and believe me um, it, it, I'm sure it made an impact on the legislators I mean I'm hoping anyway probably well, did. it did have an impact right. you're no longer allowed to go into the DPR <laughs> office <laughs> well <laughs> it's, a, yeah, it's a taxpayer but, funded uh, building yeah. we can't go in anymore we did actually have a pretty substantial impact. So we, this, I mean, we've gone to Sacramento a couple different summers. When we went in the summer of 2016, three months later, we were advocating for buffer zones. Three months later, the state said, okay, here's a policy, we're proposing it. And that was the quarter mile buffer zones that were just implemented in January. And then when we went back to Sacramento uh, in summer of 2017, we were saying California needs to ban chlorpyrifos. And just two months later, the California Department of Pesticide Regulation said, okay, okay, we're looking back at the science. And, um, we're, we're looking at what we can do about it. So it was a bureaucratic response, but it was a, res a response nonetheless. And we could be looking at severely restricted uh, core fear use in the next year, which is really uplifting. Good. And you know, uh, I think more people do care. Oh, Bruce, did you want to ask a question? Or yeah. Answer? It seems that when one or another pest one or more pesticides are, are banned, that there's just a parade of other pesticides. Uh, so. What kind of um, legislation would be needed so that we, we just don't keep ch chasing the next pesticide, which may be just as bad as the one that you just successfully terminated? Not yet successfully terminated. Um, well, even though you haven't terminated it, its use is way down. Yeah. But other pesticides are way up in yeah. direct correlation, and they're just as bad. Yeah. So, and so what's needed? multiple pesticides applied in sequence or applied, mixed together, which has never been studied or approved until um, UCLA. Yeah, UCLA yeah, yeah. did the big study saying, it isn't just like it's one effect plus of the other two effects. It's greater than that when you combine them. Nobody knows 
change what they're doing. So what kind of legislation would be needed as a bigger picture? So back in the beginning of 2016, our group pushed legislation to, um, it was in the spirit of buffer zones around schools, you know, reducing pesticide use altogether around sensitive areas. And the idea was to use these areas as innovation zones, where the state would put funding uh, into developing organic agriculture in those areas. So that was a really great idea that actually a teacher from Watsonville came up with, and our whole state and national organization ran with it. Um, that bill died in the bag subcommittee really quick. So we're facing a tremendous, uh, tremendous obstacles in the state legislature, um, but we do recognize that the pesticide treadmill is a huge issue. And while we're fighting against chlorpyrifos, um, the alternatives, some of the alternatives aren't looking very much better. Um, one reason why Quipirifos is such a, I guess, monumental case is it's really the, the big proof of it is that scientific evidence doesn't matter in the eyes of our current federal EPA. And uh, we really want to make a change in that regard. Yeah, much of the science was developed here in the Salinas Valley starting about the year 2000. So this is very low. I'm sure we would have had more people today if the film wasn't titled Circle of Poison. It maybe it have been titled Enchanted Circle of Profit and da da da. And, you know, but, but unfortunately, I think the title is a little off putting because people don't really want to. Well, you know, I, mean, I shouldn't say that to the people are here, but, but when you think, oh, Circle of Poison. And I really want something that sort of, you know, how people are when they just don't know anything about it. Isn't there any Star Wars coming out? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there any Star Wars coming out? <laughs> we should say, Talk you know, about the, the cir circle of, of, of Star Wars related something. We could have put some little, they should have, well, next time we do it, we'll change the title a little bit. We'll tweak the title to make it more engaging and inviting. But, um, but it is, I think we showed it in classrooms. I know when I was actually subbing at uh, Monterey uh, Colton Middle School, this the teacher showed a film called The Green Something, and it, it was about pesticides, and it was about, it, it had something in it about the Salinas River, and it talked about the amphibians that were the bellwethers, or the, you know, the ones that were used to predict the amount of pesticides and the impact that was being caused by pesticides entering the river on um, amphibians, frogs and whatnot, and, and I thought, wow, this is wonderful, a middle school teacher is showing a film on the environment, and I can't remember the name of it, but there are teachers doing really good things in the schools, too. But it's just, I just want to call your attention to the fact there are a number of pamphlets on this back table. Yes. Um, I, I, these are the last of the ones I have, we'll have to order some more. Uh, and Christy brought them as well. Great. Yes, thank you so much. Well, Christy, Christy, thank you. I also wanted to say that it seems like the answer to it, besides I don't think we're magically going to all go organic, which would be the answer, you know, but, but I'm wondering if, if just across the nation in, in terms of um, the whole issue of uh, a safety model in, in, is being thought about in law enforcement um, in, instead of uh, incarceration or a, a, instead of addressing um, you know infraction or, or that there's a there's a, a, a sensibility of safety for people <coughs> and safety maybe if we you know um, that's why I like the name for safe bag safe schools safe gets people's attention and we all want safety for everybody you know people don't have a clue uh, that pesticides are so harming and that's why it's so good that, that this movie happened, you know, people, people don't know. They yeah. really don't know. Thank you, Judy, for speaking all this up. It's a hard movie to watch. It's a hard movie to watch. So thank you for staying and watching it. And uh, thank you both speakers for being here and, and Sustainable Marina for co-hosting this. Thank you very much, Natalie, yeah. and Lonnie, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.